I'm joined now uh, by former president of the NAACP, Cornell William Brooks, as well as the former head of the Congressional Black Caucus, Cong Congressman um, G.K. Butterfield. Good to see both of you, gentlemen. It's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, you first. What are your thoughts on the passing of uh, John Lewis after this six-month battle with stage four pancreatic cancer? Well, thank you, Frederico, for bringing us on today to, to celebrate a, a, a wonderful human being. Uh, I want America to know that John Robert Lewis was the undisputed moral leader of our time. And so we in the Congressional Black Caucus and the House Democratic Caucus mourn his passing, um, but we know the world is better because he lived. I had the privilege of talking and interacting with John Lewis almost every legislative day for the past 15 years. Mm. And I knew the man, I knew him very well. I would walk with him from the Capitol back to our offices. Never ever did he meet a stranger. Never would he uh, refuse to stop and take a selfie or a picture with young people who were visiting the Capitol. He would be courteous to the, to the custodial staff and the Capitol Police and all of those who work and support our work in Washington. Uh, he was a wonderful human being and we will miss him dearly. Uh, I recall uh, so many things. One that stands out in my mind was during the debate uh, on the Affordable Care Act. You may refer to it as Obamacare. Uh, the Tea Party had assembled outside of the Capitol, and we were advised by the Capitol Police and by Mr. Lewis's chief of staff that we should not uh, exit the Capitol but should go underground. But it was John Lewis and Emmanuel Cleaver and, and Andre Carson and myself who made the determined decision to walk right through the crowd. And as we did that, we did it boldly, and we followed John Lewis right back to our offices uh, amidst all of the acrimony that was taking place. Uh, we will miss John Lewis. He meant so much to the Congress. So, Congressman, tell me about, you know, Congressman Lewis's comfort level, seemingly with anyone everywhere you know, no matter what the circumstances, you just painted a beautiful picture there, you know, from Capitol Hill to the White House, you know, out on the street to, I mean, to be part of this comic book, you know, a few years ago with these young men and then actually go to Comic-Con, you know, uh, tell me about how his, just his adaptability and, and just the way he found comfort no matter where he was and engaged with people of all walks. I'm not suggesting that he would casually and occasionally speak mm. to people every day. It was his passion mm. uh, to walk up to people and introduce himself and to take pictures with them. And so often uh, the visitors to the Capitol were just in awe of the fact that John Lewis came up to them and introduced himself. As we would walk through airports from time to time, and I traveled with John overseas several times, wherever we would go, uh, he would stop and say a kind word to everyone mm. that he would meet. Uh, John uh, would often talk about his passing. Uh, I remember showing him a picture one day of all of the participants at the 1963 March on Washington, and he just shook his head uh, that day and said, you know, I'm the only one who is still living, but my day will come too. Uh, I remember that so very well. Oh, wow. And I remember him telling me one day that the African American Museum was his dream and that he could not leave this planet, could not leave the Congress without seeing the full realization of the African American Museum. Wow, and, and that happened. And, and just hearing you talk about how just even in the airport, I wasn't gonna tell this story, but it now makes me remember, I was on the plane and I just heard this voice as I was trying to take my seat in coach and I heard this voice, hey, Ms. Whitfield, and I turned around and it was Congressman Lewis also flying in coach and he would say to me, you make us proud. Mm -hmm. And I would think to myself, this is from Congressman Lewis. I mean, I, I was at that moment thinking, wait a minute, I make you proud. You, I mean, you are Congressman Lewis. But then I remember that voice, you know, from, of my mom in my head saying, when any, whenever anyone gives you a compliment, you know, you accept that compliment, you know, and, and, and be proud of that compliment. But that was an example of just making someone else feel good. We hadn't met before that moment. And he would take the time to do that and, and, you know, just give me the highest compliment I could ever, you know, enjoy from someone like him. One. I remember yeah. one day he came to the House floor and said, can you believe they're naming a submarine, the, the, the USS mm -hmm. John Lewis? 
uh, or an aircraft carrier, USS John Lewis. He was so thankful that, that this carrier would be named after him. And I would fuss with him from time to time about going to the West Coast for the weekend to make two and three speeches and back in Washington on Monday. But he was happy to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cornell, I see you nodding. I mean, you, have, you are full, I'm sure, with so many, you know, anecdotes yeah. and yeah. stories and thoughts about Congressman Lewis. What, what are you anxious to share with us? Uh, you know, he meant so much to me as a civil rights lawyer and to so many. I, I recall uh, as president and CEO of the NAACP standing right behind him as we symbolically crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge and thinking to myself, I will forever walk in his shadow and thinking about the fact that when we trying to stand in his moral lineage and legacy, uh, we marched from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C., a thousand miles for voting rights. And when we get to Washington, who greets us but John Lewis, mm -hmm. who laid down his life for the right to vote. And I think about the time uh, when I uh, went back to my alma mater, Yale Law School, to give a speech. I wrap up the speech. I'm walking across the campus. I see this very familiar looking face, very friendly looking uh, face of a black man, kind of chill. And he says to me, hey, do you know where the uh, the bookstore is? I want to get a T-shirt. And so I say, hey, my, my name is Cornell. Uh, I'll walk you over. He said, my name is John. And then he added Lewis as though uh, oh. he had to distinguish himself. <laughs> From, from all the other Johns. From another John. <laughs> <laughs> extraordinarily, oh, wow. extraordinarily uh, humble, yeah. kind. And the thing I think about is, is as a professor of leadership mm -hmm. is that John Lewis was a leader prodigy. So when you think about him writing letter after letter to Dr. King mm -hmm. as a high schooler. Wait a minute, starting uh, at 15 years old. Right. That's right. Uh, at, at leading demonstrations at 18, mm. at 21 uh, sit-ins, speaking at the March in Washington at age 23, and as an elder statesman, yeah. standing on Black Lives Matter Plaza, wearing a mask, carrying a cane in the middle of a pandemic, inspiring mm. activists and demonstrators around the globe. Yeah. As my young son uh, Hamilton said to me, Dad, he's a real one. Yeah. And he's the realest among the real ones, meaning real a stand-up, courageous, brave mm -hmm. uh, man who just inspires so many people still. All of it. Oh, so true. Oh, Cornell Brooks, uh, Congressman Butterfield, thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you, Frederica. Really beautiful. Thanks, Frederica. Oh, he was about to say something. Congressman, so sorry for that. It made me tear up. That was just so lovely. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. We'll be back.